eight o'clock. Yes. Okay. Well, I uh, think we are going to wait a little bit to let all the attendees in first. Just waiting because it looks like it's still coming in. Okay. All right. Well, it's ten. Uh, it's uh, it's about time. I think just a few more seconds for people to log in. Will we see them if they if they're logged in or no? Oh, okay. Uh, yeah, we see uh, uh, people are still logging in. I think. No, no, but it's the, like this setup is is kind of like webinar, like so we don't see them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right. Nope. Okay, well, we're going to go get started. Um, uh, I know some people will be joining us a little bit later, um, but I, um, I want to first of all say hello and good afternoon to everyone and welcome. Uh, thank you for joining us today for uh, the World Affairs Council's virtual speaker series, Diplomacy in the National Parks. Our program is in partnership with Wilderness Louisville. My name is Xiao Yin Zhao. I am the Executive Director of the World Affairs Council of Kentucky and Southern Indiana. We are a hub for international exchange, dialogue, and learning located in Louisville, Kentucky. As a member of two national networks, the Global Ties US and the World Affairs Councils of America, we facilitate a variety of international professional and youth programs for, uh, for the Kentucky and our region year long, in addition to speaker programs and educational opportunities. We also very recently assumed management of the Sister Cities of Louisville programs, which we are very excited about and uh, which will provide more avenues for cultural, educational and professional exchanges. Uh, the World Affairs Council is a member supported organization. But we are not member exclusive in our programs, which are all open to the public. Um, our goal is always to ensure that you still have access to expert analysis and quality discussions on topics that impact us locally, nationally, and globally. So for today's top, uh, topic, our program is Diplomacy in the National Parks, and we are delighted to welcome Ms. Christine Dalbello, who is joining us from Amsterdam, right? Brussels. Brussels, that's right, it's from Brussels. One of those two. <laughs> and uh, Christine is a Foreign Service Officer with the U.S. Department of State and has spent the last year on a sabbatical fellowship from the Una Chapman Cox Foundation and the State Department. Uh, Christine's journey to 29 states and two U.S. territories allowed her to visit more than 85 units of the National Park Service to promote the importance of historical, cultural, and natural preservation. As part of her fellowship, she became a certified California naturalist and a certified interpretive guide. Welcome, Christine. Thank you very much. Of course. And our moderator for the discussion today is Mr. Bennett Knox, Executive Director of Wilderness Louisville and Administrator for the Jefferson Memorial Forest. Wilderness Louisville is a nonprofit organization founded in 2013 with a mission to be champions for Louisville's natural areas from Jefferson Memorial Forest, which is the nation's largest municipally owned urban forest, to the ones in our neighborhoods. They work in partnership with the Louisville Metro Government's Department of Parks and Recreation to promote the development, stewardship, and community awareness of these important public spaces. We are also very fortunate to have Bennett as a member of the World Affairs Council's Board of Directors. Welcome, Bennett. And before we begin, uh, we begin, I just want to do a quick reminder for everybody about the functionalities and what our run of show today is going to look like. Uh, this uh, webinar is recorded and is live streamed on Facebook. We will provide a link to the recording after this program. Uh, Christine will begin with a 20 minute presentation, which will be followed by a discussion with Bennett and moderated Q&A, and that's gonna be another 30 minutes. Uh, some of these questions that you submitted ahead of time will be included in that, uh, that Q&A. 
And pl but please note that you can submit questions during any time during this uh, program, and they will answer as many as uh, the time allows. And if you prefer, you can ask questions verbally. You just have to um, raise that little hand control on the bottom and we will unmute you. So without further ado, I will now turn it over to Christine to start us off. Christine. Thank you very much, Xiaoyan and Bennett. I'm delighted to be here today. I will go ahead and share my screen. Um, so just one second. So uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, as Shandian mentioned, I'm a former service officer with the Department of State, and I was very fortunate um, this past year to have had the year off to uh, pursue a project of my choosing. And what I chose and what I submitted in my proposal was to um, visit the national parks of the United States. And the seed for my um, proposal actually came from a 2016 trip in the Midwest, and which also included a visit to uh, your your home city. Um, I know that <laughs> Louisville. Um, and in this trip, my we, I, my older kids, uh, you can see them there. It's funny to see them so small. They had gone to um, camp in West Virginia, and I picked them up and was you know looking for an itinerary. I knew that it was going to be West Virginia's start. And at that point, I did not know that much about national parks. But in just plotting out the journey, um, we went to um, Hopewell Culture in Ohio. And then I decided we'd fly out of, of Nashville and, and visited Mammoth Cave as well. So this really planted a seed. And I was like, these parks are so amazing. And I think a lot of people, including myself, when, when you think of natural, national parks, think about what you see at my virtual screen, my virtual background, or the photo that you see right here. This is Muir Woods, which was protected in nine, 1908, and it's one of the first um, you know, 20 um, units uh, that were, were pieces of land that were protected in the United States. So you, you really think of the Yosemites and the Yellowstones, and that's what I, what I thought as well. But there are so many smaller historical um, and cultural parks as well. and so. That was kind of one of the premises of, of my you know, project that I said that I wanted to, prom to try to promote these lesser visited ones because, of course, um, you hear about the crowds at, at, at Yellowstone, but so many of the parks we went to were, were very under visited. There might be you know, 30 to 100 people a day and you really get, you know, the opportunity to engage with, with the rangers. So these are our you know, photos from uh, Louisville. And here we are uh, getting junior ranger badges at Mammoth Cave. Unfortunately, our, our photos, it was quite dark inside, obviously, being in a cave. <laughs> so, so that's a lot of people think yeah, that's you know, Old Faithful erupting this winter. So I, we did go to, to some of the, the, the parks um, that were well known. It's not that we you know, did not include them in our list. Um, they're impressive. Uh, we, this was an amazing um, experience to go to Yellowstone during the winter. Someone described it as being in a snow globe and it really was. I mean, I would highly recommend it for, for anyone that has the opportunity. There's so few people and I'm not a winter person and I, it, was, it, was, it was just really lovely. Um, we kind of made our own flag um, and that's Grand Canyon of Yellowstone. And then this was Acadia. We went during fall foliage system. Yeah, fall foliage. This is thunder. Kind of here a little bit. So at the end, we got a little splash there. I mean, it was gorgeous. That's Bubble Rock and Acadia. We went to Hawaii. This is Haleakala. So I'm not saying we didn't go to you know the well-known parks as well, um, Bryce Canyon. But look at this map i mean of the treasures that you know we have within the united states these are just the national park units the 419 units and with a variety of designations from battlefield to seashore to lakeshore to monument to national historical site and park etc um it really doesn't matter um I, I i believe what the designation is it's it's really you know you know that this is a special place because it has been protected and that's not to say that it there's also the state, city, uh, county parks 
to 599 national <laughs> national natural landmarks. So this, you know, this kind of, well, I hope that you come away from this presentation, you know, realizing how lucky we are to be in the United States and have to, so much, you know, that we, that is ours because it, it belongs to the people of the United States and that we, we can explore. So the other thing I really wanted to focus on and I got kind of more interested in is, as time went on is like, what connections were there in these parks uh, to diplomacy? And I started out with like thinking about three of them that I had kind of um, been suggested to me, the San Juan Islands in, in Washington state where they avoided a war um, thanks to negotiations and diplomacy. Um, uh, Jimmy Car Carter National Historic Site, because that molded him as a, as a person, and then Eisenhower National Historic uh, a Site, um, which I did, which I did visit, because he entertained a lot of um, world leaders there. But the more I visited parks, the more I I discovered, you know, connections. This th th this next one, um, the Grand Tetons, is not a place I was un I unfortunately was not able to visit. Um, but uh, this is a park that has inspired, the, the, the natural beauty of this place has in, inspired individuals to be their best selves and strive for cooperation and peace. So I've kind of divided up like the, this next part of the presentation in, in a three, three, three kind of sub themes. And it's like parks that have con direct connections in my opinion to diplomacy. And, and this, this topic right now is the ones where the natural beauty it serves its inspiration in and of itself. So this site um, played Grand Teton um, National Park. Um, they actually had a, a pre-summit meeting between Foreign, Min Foreign Minister Shevardnadze and then Secretary of State James Paker in, in 1989. And I'll just read you um, something from the New York Times. The two-day meeting at the Jackson Lake Lodge, not far from Mr. Baker's ranch, the Jackson Lake Lodge in Grand Teton National Park was more productive than most of the meetings between American and Soviet foreign ministers in recent years. More progress was made here in arms control than at the Moscow summit meeting last year between President Ronald Reagan and President uh, Gorbachev. And from what I read about the, the meeting, it was a very personal meeting and they were in these amazing surroundings, but they also had the time and opportunity to get to know each other. They went fishing together, which apparently was so successful that it, there was a re uh, um, reciprocal invitation to visit. Um, the Soviet Union for him to fish. They talked about their family. So they, they it, it was in the site itself and its natural beauty was important. Another um, place, and this I didn't discover until I actually visited, um, this Muir Woods, which is the background. This is not a very good shot. It's, an, it's a historic photo, but I, I'm going to um, play a short video um, to uh, explain why Muir Near Woods is important. Today, in the very heart of Muir Woods National Monument, a bronze plaque quietly reminds visitors that an event of international significance took place here amid the profound silence and serenity of the ancient Redwoods as World War II was coming to an end. But 75 years ago, the world was at war, our nation mourning the loss of President Franklin Delano Roosevelt recently sworn in President Truman's first decision was to proceed with the San Francisco Peace Conference. And so on April 25th, 1945, 268 delegates representing 46 nations gathered in San Francisco to open the first session of the United Nations Conference. The atmosphere was solemn. The delegates worked hard on difficult issues. On May 19th, they took time off to honor the memory of FDR, a lover of trees, with a walk and ceremony among the peaceful, timeless redwoods of Muir Woods. <laughs> Okay.
So, I mean, yes, I'm not saying that this gathering <laughs> equated to the success of the, the, the UN Charter Conference. I'm not saying that, but it, it, it definitely provided uh, an important an important group of people a very peaceful and peaceful environment for them to think about the importance of the work that they were doing. And um, this is a quote from the then Secretary of the Interior um, to President Roosevelt um, discussing um, how, oops, excuse me, how you know this temple of peace would allow the delegates to gain a perspective and a sense of time that they couldn't obtain anywhere better than in a forest. And it's actually called Cathedral Grove. It just gives one at that kind of perspective of how small we all are. So I really um, do think um, that it, it played an important role. And unfortunately, um, you know, President Roosevelt died just before the, the UN Charter Conference was due to take place. And in fact, it was um, President Truman's, one of his first acts was to, to, to confirm that the, the, the Charter Conference would, would still take place. And uh, so what, what would have been just kind of a meeting ended up being kind of a memorial kind of service or a memorial um, opportunity um, in honor of, of President Roosevelt. So those are two places that I think are, you know, was the, the natural beauty, you know, has inspired people um, and has therefore um, had an impact on, on domestic and world affairs. Then there's also some sites that we found that commemorate um, peaceful resolution um, of conflicts and, and the kind of the promotion of diplomacy. And one such is Chambazal National Memorial in El Paso, Texas. I did not know about this uh, park at all. Um, it's an urban park, in fact, um, right on the border. And it commemorates the successful um, ne negotiations leading to a treaty to, to reestablish the border because it was the Rio Grande and it meandered. And for over a hundred years, there was a big dispute and it led to you know, very difficult relationship with Mexico. So um, because of the Cold War and other um, matters, um, President Kenny thought it was important to kind of bring this to conclusion. So you can see this is actually a, a a mural on the outside of the visitor center and you can see President Kennedy um, very much in the center and he started the negotiations and it took a while um, but they weren't concluded until after his death and um, this is one of the old uh, markers uh, border markers and um, President Johnson the president of Mexico came down to El Paso to have like a formal ceremony and erect a monument and then you can go in the visitor center and uh, recreate your own uh, your own version of the historic uh, photo, because this was you know a huge accomplishment. And there's a it's not necessarily a sister park, um, but there is a park on the other side of the, the border that's a, a a Mexican park. And this park is very much uh, dedicated to celebrating the cross border culture. There's a performing arts center and, and they, they do a lot of uh, theater festivals and performances. It's open to the community. Of course, now with COVID that's been impacted, but it's a very unique place. Then there are sites that celebrate history making individuals, um, including those with success in the diplomatic sphere. And then I think that visiting these sites and learning more about these people can inspire us um, to, you know, to work for for the same to work for you know better communities and, and, and peace. So some sites that um, I learned you know what after upon visiting um, the kind of the diplomatic connection um, was at the Frederick Douglass um, site in Washington DC. I, I thought this was an interesting photo because it shows them through the years. But he was our minister to Haiti. This is a kind of an artistic rendering re rendering of that. I mean he was so talented and successful in so many fields, abolitionist, suffragist, author, editor, but also diplomat. And that's something I didn't really realize until I visited the site. This is another, that's a picture of, uh, of the home. It's, it's in Anacostia, just within the city of um, the District of Columbia. 
Then another um, place uh, where I was surprised to kind of find a diplomatic connection was uh, the Clara Barton uh, site, um, just just outside of DC in, in Maryland. Um, it's it's her home and the the kind of the headquarters of the American Red Cross for many years. And it was only after seeing um, a a wayside like a site a site a sign outside the house that I realized that she'd gotten the idea from the Red Cross, from you know, the International Red Cross. And she wanted to bring that back to the United States. And to do that, we needed to sign the Geneva Convention. And so she lobbied Congress. This is a letter to the Senate Foreign Relations Committee. Um, that is something that struck me in a lot of these parks. I mean, even those that do not have diplomatic connections, how important um, one individual or a group of individuals, you know, could be because you know they were involved in their community and they would draw the attention for the need for preservation for the park and that would you know they would engage their local community their representatives and it would go up the chain so um, citizen diplomats and you know the important role of citizens and I know a lot of you are citizen diplomats and I thank you because I you know on my previous assignment I was public affairs officer um, at a post uh, in Dubai and we would you know help select the the international visitors but then we would, we wouldn't get to go on the trip with them obviously we would hear about all their amazing experiences and they were always so impressed by the people they met and all the wonderful home hospitality and they learned so much so thank you for the you know your interest um, and willingness to serve as citizen diplomats and this is the Marsh Billings uh, Rockefeller National Historic Park and um, it was one of the centerpieces of, the, of this park is the is the boyhood home of George Perkins Marsh, um, featured, there he is, a little bit younger. Um, and growing up there, he saw the kind of the, the, the devastation that deforestation, you know, had in his local community. Um, and then he was, um, he became the first US minister to Italy, like basically the ambassador, and he was there for 21 years. And then he saw what was happening in Europe, and there was deforestation, but he also saw kind of land management practices and all of these experiences impacted his thinking and in writing and he, he put out a seminal work called man and nature which was published in 1864 and it changed people's perceptions of the relationship between humans and the world so a lot of people you know consider him like a you know a pioneer and father of conservation so i'm wrapping up my time um but i wanted to just you know encourage all of that's the the boyhood home just mentioned that um the important role of the Office of International Affairs within the National Park Service. They run a sister park program and Mammoth Cave is partnered um, with the South China Karst World Heritage Site. Um, so um, this is just from their, web, their website. You can find out more there. The Office of International Affairs also, also offers consultation and technical training to, to, to specific countries. And they can part. They we work. They work with the State Department on on different programs on the ground as well. For example, when I was in Dubai, I can't. You know, we used and worked with them to um, bring a speaker to a National Park Service speaker to our city um, to spearhead um, a Discover America kind of series. Um, it was actually like a two week festival, and it was all about promoting America as a business destination, promoting goods and services and trade, but also tourism. And so um, it was it was very helpful. And uh, kind of our, one of our flagship events was actually a, a screening of a movie and the Minister of the Environment of the local, of, that, of our, you know, of the host country came as well. And so, you know, I encourage you, I'm sure a lot of you have already visited many of the parks around you, but, you know, if you haven't to go to, I think the best kind of site to start on it at is the National Park Service site, nps.gov, and you can look by state. Um, there's also um, a hard copy map that you can get if you purchase the passport, which kind of helps you log. It gives you a little description of, you know, the regions and a short description of each site, but you can also do kind of record your journey with like passport stamps. So people like to collect uh, the, these, these stamps. And um, I always, I'm always, whenever I plan any trip now, I always look to see what's around to, to, to see if I can visit a new park or go visit a, a, a park again, because you get a totally different experience. And I know, um, you know, COVID times, it's a bit difficult, but just, they have some great resources on um, recreating responsibly. 
including some that are actually kind of funny. Uh, they try to bring some humor into it. And then I would encourage you, um, if you have kids or you know young people in your life, but even for yourself, to look at the junior ranger programs at these sites. Some of them are available online. There's also a lot of distance and virtual programs now. And some of the sites even have not so junior ranger programs or you know, programs for elders or whatever they want to call it, because it really helps you engage with the site and learn a lot more. And I picked out this one because this is Catoctin Mountain Park, which is also home to Camp David, which you can't visit, but it's also obviously a very important place um, for diplomacy. And if you do, um, sorry, let's see if I can get it in there. There you go. These are like the badges that you can earn. This is a badge and you can also earn patches depending on the, the place that you go. So it, you know, it, it really helps motivate, especially young people. And uh, not to, to, this is a podcast that I put together with my kids um, and, you know, to help encourage people to uh, go to some of these sites. And we were basically sharing some of the conversations and the things that we've learned. And that's, that's it. I'm just a little bit over. I apologize. And look forward to your questions. Well, Christine, that's just absolutely fantastic. So glad that, that you can relay the, your experiences on your trip and want to find out more. I guess I'll just real quickly say if anyone has any questions, if you're on the call, you can put the question in the chat box. And uh, I'm going to uh, ask a few questions here and then we'll, we'll get to those uh, from, from, the, from the audience. So I um, hope we have a good mix of folks who are, are uh, you know, associated with World Affairs Council and also folks that are potentially uh, coming from the Wilderness Louisville side as we promoted it as well, because we are very fortunate to have a great park system here in Louisville. So I love what you were talking about of how people can get involved uh, in starting you know, some exploration locally and expanding that out. Um, so I really kind of wanted to start with that. Um, you know, you've traveled around the world uh, and then so planning this trip, um, in a, what did you do specifically to try to prepare for that? You know, I think you took your kids, you know, right. with that one. You know, uh, what were some experiences you had that you might want to share with folks to get them started? Yeah, no, so I mean, we did two shorter trips, like week long trips, road trips. So I should say for the last 20 or so years, I haven't spent that much continuous time in the United States. Um, but for the last seven years, every, every, um, we were living in a very hot environment. And so we'd come back for a summer and uh, like the, the kids would spend seven to eight weeks and we always try to, 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 to do a trip. So, I mean, I, I would say start with your kind of local, um, but in terms of what I did, um, I was trying to, to go to places that I hadn't been to before. So, um, and different things kind of served as the kind of the inspiration, like the next kind of um, hook for, I did the Midwest one and where we went at Mammoth Cave. But the next time I had learned a, on a podcast, um, the presidential podcast that President, former President Carter does um, Sunday school in his small church in, in Plains, Georgia, which is also the site of, an, of a park. And I was like, wouldn't that be so interesting? And uh, that there was actually a kind of a connection to a previous post of mine. His, his mother was actually a Peace Corps volunteer in her set, like when she was 70 in, in Mumbai, India. And that was a, a previous post of mine. And he actually came there for a build with Habitat for Humanity. Um, there was, one, they do a global one every other year. So, you know, I just, I thought that just was so interesting. And we got up, we didn't get to our hotel in America's Georgia until like one something in the morning. And we got there, I think at six, it was a little bit away and the kids never complained. And there were people from everywhere. I mean, mostly Americans, but I just thought it was like, so, so amazing to see people from so many places. And we had to wait quite a while and the kids were just kind of like pretty awestruck. So that, that, and then we did kind of like civil war and civil rights on that trip. So, I mean, there are a lot, it's almost too overwhelming how much information is out there. Each, so many of the states have like recommended itineraries. You know, if, if you love to, you know, books, I mean, there's just so many things, but I think starting with the National Park Service website kind of can serve as an anchor and then you can kind of fill in things kind of along the way. Fantastic. So uh, you mentioned in your in your talk uh, this idea of citizen diplomacy. Um, yeah. So I, I know in my experience uh, with World Affairs Council and as a student, uh, a lot of folks come over here and, and their first impression of America is through our parks. Uh, and so I wonder if, if I, you know, you've, with the experiences you've had overseas and here, um, you know, can you elaborate on any examples that you've 
seen in your, your journeys of how that is, you know, actually works in practice with Americans? And then is there any kind of corollary with, with what you see if folks go abroad, you know, how, how, uh, how they present America to... Yeah, no, and exactly. And I think it's a little tough right now during COVID times because, you know, you're tr trying to maintain distance and, you know, but let's say normal times, you know, trying to be, and even within COVID times as well, trying to be as, you know, friendly as possible. Um, for example, uh, there's some, quite a few summer work travel participants. Um, this is a J1 exchange program where uh, you, foreign university students can come to the United States to work for most of the time, but then they have some time at the end or at the beginning to, to travel. And you often find them in, in, in national parks and lodges and things. And so if actually for the podcast, I just interviewed a, a, a few of them. And my kids hate this because every time I like hear, you know, if I hear like that they're, you know, from somewhere else, I'm like, oh, where are you from? Are you with the summer work travel? So I think, you know, just engaging people, I mean, it can be a little tricky because like, you know, some people, not everyone wants to talk and to engage and, you know, but to, to, you know, just one thing I think that a lot of Americans are known for is, is how friendly we are. So to, to, you know, to ask if you can help or just to say hi or, you know, to, to try to engage them. Because I think whenever I've traveled to another country, you know, having those local meetings and connections with people from that country are so important. I mean, because you can stay within your bubble of your, especially if you're in a tour group, you know, you never even talk to someone from that country. So to the extent that you can, when you're in the U.S. as an American or someone, a resident of America, you know, just to engage people um, that you meet along the way. I mean, whether they're foreign or not. I mean, I think a lot of times there's so much, uh, you know, people from all over different parts of the states. So we all want to need to, you know, need to want to learn about each other more. And then when you're traveling abroad, um, you know, you, whether you like it or not, people will see you as a representative of the United States. You're like a kind of a de facto ambassador. So, you know, doing your, you know, your best to present, you know, America, because the thing is, Amer you know, they might have a particular perception of, of what the United States is, you know, for movies or whatever, you know, showing how diverse it is. Often people say, oh, oh you don't look American, or, I mean, that's, you know, there's like a misunderstanding of, of what America, you know, is. So. Fantastic. Well, we've got some questions coming in. I have to have a couple more before we get some, some really good questions from, from the audience here. Um, so, you know, World Affairs Council recently absorbed sister cities, uh, and as Michelle, you mentioned, we're just very excited about embarking on that uh, and extending that tradition that we have. And so you, you mentioned just briefly this concept of a sister park. And right. I wonder if you could talk about in your experiences, have you come in contact with uh, those kind of relationships that, that parks have across the country? And maybe talk a little no. about international yeah. collaborations that you see. Yeah. No, some parks, like there's the Waterton Glacier, which is like, kind of, it's, um, it's part, partly in Canada and partly in, in a Glacier National Park. So I visited, but I didn't get, get over to the Canada side. So I haven't had any like specific personal experience kind of with the sister parks, but it sounds very similar to the kind of the sister city relationship. And a lot of it comes from like the, 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 the interest and the dedication of the kind of the, the people involved. And um, I think it's amazing that you guys are, are gonna be working out in the sister city uh, um, program. And actually, I was a sister, my first exchange program was as a sister city um, exchange student. Um, my, my town is uh, sister cities with Puerto Vallarta, Mexico. And uh, I went down there for, you know, I think it was two weeks. And we, it was like a direct exchange. So we hosted the, the, the brother and sister, at, you know, at our house. So it was, I mean, it's really fascinating. And the thing is, like, those, a lot of those sister city, you know, programs are only as, as strong as, as the volunteers and the people that are involved in it. And so um, thank you for all the, you know, all your, all the people in your community that are involved in these things. I always feel bad because I can never kind of pay it forward. I was an exchange student again, actually at the State Department um, exchange student in Germany, and I haven't been able to, 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 to host any exchange students just because of like, you know, what we do traveling. But one thing I found very interesting this year, I came across a family that's the Maitland family. I think they're from Michigan. They visited all 419 national parks, okay, as a family. So I think their child has like the record of being the youngest person to ever visit. But what I found astounding was I think two different years, they hosted two different sets of exchange students. And those exchange students traveled in their RV to all these different uh, national parks. So I mean, I thought that was, 
amazing. Well, I know it if, if Shalyan was on, she would talk about you know, the groups that come into Louisville. Uh, that's that's a trip they take uh, quite quite often, I believe, to Mammoth Cave. It's so close uh, and such so inspiring. Right. No, and it's there's so much historical. I mean, that's the thing. You think it's like okay, maybe it's a scientific thing or. But then there's like the historical. I mean, that's the thing. You think that you're going to a site for X, and then you find that there's three, four other important things. And that's what I really um, have really come away with this the, from the from visiting these parks is how much I still need to learn. But the problem is, but the more you go to, the longer your list of you know books to read or or things to learn about it becomes. But you know, it's it's a lifelong journey um, and. You know, I say in the podcast, you know, 419 parks and some people try to do it in a year, which is, and you know, very, very difficult because they're, it, it, they're so spread out, but there is no time limit. I mean, you can, you know, we have until as long, you know, so, so that's the beauty. So even though COVID obviously really put it, um, you know, made it difficult to, to continue let up our travels and we had to basically stop in March, um, you know. I know that they're there and they're protected, so we'll visit them, you know, someday. So if we wanted to learn more or anyone in the community wanted to learn more about the, the sister parks, um, how would they go about finding that information? So on the website of the, the national, I, I, would, I could probably look, I, I'm not adept enough, but the, just it, it's on the, this, the, the website. And then I would say that then contact directly the the individual park to, to find out more if 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 you know you're local to that park or there's something specific because that's one thing I find very interesting about the national parks they they're very decentralized so we went to the um, the birthplace of like Abraham Lincoln and, you know that's you think it's going to be fully historical so I was like okay I'm going to learn all about Abraham Lincoln but there was a former professor that had put together a a, a guide on you know, nature around that area. And so you could check out from the, from the visitor center, a backpack on cloud identification, tree identification. So, I mean, it was designed for families, but I think everything designed for kids is great because it's, it's, it's a level that's like easy to access. So you don't have to, you know, necessarily have kids with you to do it, but it was very much to kind of engage with the natural environment around you. And he was probably a volunteer at the park and, you know, like discussed it with them. So, I mean, there's, there's a lot that, that can be done. They seem to be very decentralized. So there's, they seem more open than most kind of government institutions to um, be able to absorb kind of like the talent of, of the communities around them. And then often there is almost always, there's like a, like a, a friends group um, that is like the kind of like the partner and they, 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 can, they can do fun. They have a lot more flexibility and they can help support the park in a lot of different ways, including fundraising. Well, I want to get to some of the questions that we had uh, from the audience. We have some good ones here. So um, I'll start with um, this one of, you know, what was your greatest discovery during your year of expeditions? And did you have any misconceptions about the park system going in uh, before the journey? Uh, and maybe what was your favorite park? Oh, this is always like the loaded question. You know, it's like the last one I visited or the next one. It's like, it's like choosing, you know, you're a child, like who's your favorite child? They're like all so different. Um, I would say like a special park to me is like kind of like my hometown park, um, uh, Channel Islands National Park, because it's a good reminder, like how sometimes you have such amazing resources in your own backyard. I literally, so I grew up in Santa Barbara, which, you know, is right across kind of the water from the, from the, the Channel Islands, you know, and I knew they existed and we, you know, like I saw them obviously, and I don't even think I realized they were a park. I mean, it's embarrassing to say like, until a few years ago. Um, and I, I always wanted to go and I thought it would be so difficult. And, you know, I, I'll plan a trip to another country and, you know, all these things. And I was like there in my literal backyard and it was like a 45 minute drive and then an hour kind of boat ride. And I thought that was difficult. So, I mean, really kind of discovering the, in, in some ways going really broad, like I was trying to, you know, go all over the United States but the, the lesson I really took away is how much I need to learn about my own community. So during lockdown, I was, I was fortunate to be with um, my, my, my parents um, in, in Santa Barbara. And, you know, I'd started to visit some of the, the, the local trails there, but I hadn't been to like the vast majority of the city county parks. Or if I had gone to them, I would go to the same one. Like growing up, we'd have like a picnic at X Park, you know, but there were just so many things around there. 
So just, I really encourage people uh, to, to see what's, you know, in your local community and in a little bit, you know, beyond that, um, because there's so much that we don't realize that is there. And then, sorry, I've, yeah, so that, yeah, that's, I guess that's my greatest discovery, I guess. Well, so going from uh, kind of, you brought up that we, we all need to explore locally. Uh, I agree with that completely. We've got a lot of assets here in Louisville that uh, just it's tremendous uh, what we have just within a, a short drive. But um, so kind of going international here. Um, so how has our national park system impacted environmental or other policies in other countries that you're aware of? And have we forged close ties through those collaborations? So I'm not, I have I didn't really kind of look into that specifically, but I mean, there's definitely through these consul, um, through the Office of International Affairs, they over time, they have, they have, you know, helped to develop actual national park systems in specific countries. I, like I haven't, like that wasn't something kind of I looked into, but, and I know that they're working very closely with China. You can actually see the, the sister park list. There's 67, but there's a lot in China and a lot in Mongolia and, so, um, I mean, we weren't the first necessarily to have the idea, but I think a lot of people, um, you know, look to the U.S. as a, as a model um, as well. But that's not something, you know, I really, um, you know, focused on during right. this. Well, so in, in, in your travels, I, I see that you've been posted in a lot of different places. The list I have is Abu Dhabi, yeah. you mentioned uh, India, Vienna, Austria, Afghanistan, uh, and Jakarta, Indonesia. Um, you know, what, what have you seen in, in those countries in terms of, of their commitment to uh, preserving um, you know, treasures, natural treasures through a park system? Is that, is that across the board or is there other differences that you see? Yeah, and the funny thing is, like, until I became interested in the, the U.S. national parks, I didn't really pay that much attention to the ones in the countries that I was in even, you know. Um, and so I think that the U.S. is very lucky because we have so much land and we have the resources, you know, to, to, to protect. So not every, you know, country um, has as much there, but I think that there, I think that's kind of like a universal kind of value that people, you know, do treasure their, their natural environment. And to the extent that they can, they want to preserve and protect it. It always becomes challenging when it comes to economics and, you know, people need to, to fulfill their basic needs, right? You need, you know, food and shelter and things like that. So that can be the, the tricky kind of like conflict um, that, that comes in, in, into play. Um, but also I've seen it as a tourist, like visiting um, in Jordan, a lot of the, the, the sites that we visited, some of which would be, I don't, you know, national parks or, or you know, protected spaces, you, I would see the sign like the USAID, USAID had actually helped to kind of, um, the, the, there had been a partnership to develop signage and I mean a host of other things. So there was definitely, when it comes to tour, you know, tourism can be uh, an economic driver for a country. So that can, you, you, you see that as well. So I saw that from a, a tourist point of view. Um, have another one. Uh, do you uh, know of any park experiences or programs for students, uh, specifically high school students that you're aware of or came across? There is the yeah, there's the Student Conservation uh, Association. Um, I don't know like the, like the parameters and the eligibility, um, but okay, I'm going to go on a soapbox now if it's for high school students. Um, Look at the, don't forget to look at the State Department exchange programs as well. There's the National Security Language Initiative for Youth, which um, has summer and academic year um, opportunities in a host of countries. Um, it's, it's for kind of critical needs languages. I'm not sure how it's impacted by COVID and, you know, the, the recruitment now would be for next year. So nobody really knows what's going to happen next year. But I'd encourage, you know, this, um, whoever's asking the question to, to look to look into those. There's also, I think it's the National Park Trust. There's a student, there's a student ambassador program. Um, the, the Buddy Bison, they're on the younger side. So the Junior Ranger program is kind of usually like up until 12 or 13, but you know, people can continue it after. I know my daughter's like 13 and she's a little like, oh, I'm a little too old. But you know, there's a girl, Ida, I think her name is Junior Ranger Ida who's written a book about it. I think she's gone to 30 some parks and, you know, so um, 
And then there's a lot of opportunities, maybe not at National Park. When I did the certified uh, California naturalist, there was a young man, I think he was 16. He was I think from Washington State. He worked for a local na nature preserve and they helped to fund him to come to California to do, the, to do this program. So I would say, you know, look, look what's in uh, your community and kind of go from there. And I can say we do have a similar program in Kentucky. Uh, University of Kentucky looks like they also have a, a master naturalist program that's been offered. Uh, I know we've offered it at Jefferson Memorial Forest. Burnham Forest has had that. So if folks are looking to, uh, to gain some skills, there's some opportunities to do that here locally. That's, and so did you find that that naturalist training, did that, did that serve you well on your trips? I, once again, it's like, wow, I still need to learn so much. But I did learn about iNaturalist, which is a great app to help you kind of identify. But I mean, I met a great group of people and I learned about kind of more. It, 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 and it once again allowed me to discover something that was close to my backyard. It was only three hours away and I'd passed it many times on the um, highway. And this is j just because it took place at a camp um, that was just on the coast. And I've like learned about the UC, the University of California preserve system. They have like 20 odd like preserves themselves like that are, so I, I learned a lot from it. Um, I need to learn a lot more. <laughs> I always find like going on a walk with my kids. I wish I like, you know, could, could explain more, but I think part of it is just getting out there. I mean, not necessarily learning something. I mean, that they say, you know, now there's these, these studies that show like, you know, like, you know, that nature can be even a prescription, like going out there can actually change your mood and, and everything. And you know, apart from like the exercise and vitamin D and things like that. So I think it's just important to get out there, you know, wherever you are and, you know, safely now with COVID, but, uh, and not feel guilty that you don't know X, Y, Z, you know, you can always look it up or just enjoy the experience. And yeah. So I think it's fascinating that you were able to, to do a fellowship through, um, through the park service or, uh, you know, through foreign, foreign service, sorry, state department. Um, yeah. Do you have, a, what, what did you hope to gain from that? And is there anything that you're going to be taking back uh, to your, to your job? I mean, are you rejuvenated? What, what kind of are you looking for in the next year that you're going to use, use from this experience? Yeah. So my job now is going to be very different. I'm hoping to kind of continue with the podcast just as kind of, you know, as a side and my passion kind of passion project. And then visit the national parks here, once again, kind of on, like on the side. Um, and actually, when I was looking at the sister park list again, um, you know, like Yosemite is sister park with Berchtesgaard in, in, in Germany, you know, and there's a lot of, there's national parks, of course, here in Belgium. So kind of, kind of continue that and continue just look like learning for myself, but also to teach, you know, my, you know, my kids, because like, you know, there's just so like, we've learned history in a particular way. And, you know, depending on where in the country you, 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 you went to school, you're going to learn more about that part of, of the country. So in visiting these other parts of the country, I realized, wow, I really don't know that much about these regions and that I need to learn more. And then, you know, history is not necessarily static, right? Um, there's more narratives that come to light. So learning, just learning more about like our country, you know, where it's, where it came from and where it's, you know, going to and just continuing to learn. Well, so um, I'm, I'm curious, you mentioned the Office of uh, International uh, Affairs within the, within the Park Service. Is, is there collaboration uh, between, uh, the, you know, at the federal level between the Park Service and uh, the State Department routinely? Yeah, so that's kind of that, they, they're like the nodes. So like, for example, when I would put out like I would contact someone in the State Department, you know, I, I want to bring a speaker and then they would go to this, this office um, and, and work with them. And they actually, I should also say one of the programs they run um, is the IVIP, International Visitors and in, International Volunteers in Parks, IVIP. It is also J Visa. It's a smaller program, but um, foreign volunteers can go to the United States and be placed in a, in a specific, in a park to, 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 to volunteer for, for a, a I think it's usually a few months, I'm not sure. Um, and it's a, not a very, I didn't know about it until kind of like this year. So, I mean, IVLP is obviously um, quite, a, quite a bit larger. And then obviously the, there's the regular volunteer program for the National Park Service and there's 
I'm always, I was always uh, very impressed by how many, you know, uh, volunteers there were at all the different, like the different parks. And you brought so many different experiences to, to them, you know, retired engineer, retired bi biologist, or what, you know, it was just very fascinating to hear about their experiences. Well, so you're kind of talking about potential opportunities to volunteer, uh, kind of a great segue into a question about, you know, what, you know, you've obviously had a career with the Foreign Service that, that spanned a couple of decades. Um, for someone young or maybe not so young who's looking to, uh, uh, you know, has experience and looking possibly to get into that kind of career in, in whatever way it may be, full-time, part-time, oh, oh. can you talk about opportunities for someone? I mean, we might have some folks. For the Foreign Service? Oh, oh, definitely. So, careers.state.gov would be kind of your launching point uh, to learn more about careers within the State Department. Um, I also didn't realize until I joined how much of a wide variety of, of, of jobs there are. So often people, when they think Foreign Service officer, they kind of think like the classic political officer who, you know, does a lot of writing and reporting and things like that. So there's five cones within the Foreign Service Officer Corps, management, consular, political, economic, and public diplomacy. But then there's a huge a number of different specialties. So if, you, if you're interested in law enforcement, but you also want an international career, you could become a diplomatic security agent. We have doctors, psychiatrists, you know, office management specialists. So it's, it's very wide. Another thing is that a lot of people don't realize, I didn't realize until I joined was, you know, some people do this as a second or third career. You can join up until the time you're 60. Um, so, you know, there's, it's never, well, it, it's too late once you hit 60, but it's, you, and you only have to be, I think, 20 to take the exam, and it's a free exam, it's a written exam, so I would um, encourage people to, to sign up for it, and not to, like, sign up for it when they're, like, know for sure they want to be part of the, the, you know, become a foreign service um, specialist or, op oh, sorry, this would be office or the, the, that's what the um, exam is for. Because it can take some time, and there's it's 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 a kind of drawn out process. Um, so you know, whenever if if you just think this is something interesting, I would encourage you to um, to go for it. There's also a student internship program, and all that information can be on careers. That will be on careers.state.gov. And then we also have diplomats and residents kind of scattered throughout the country, and so I would encourage you people to look that up as well because they can contact um, um, a person directly and, and talk to them about. Uh, their career. And for someone, I mean, as a foreign service officer or specialist, you, you're meant to kind of spend about two thirds of your career overseas. Not everyone wants to spend that much time. So if that's not something that's appealing, you know, look at the civil service um, and that would be more, you'd be based in Washington, but I have a lot of opportunities uh, to travel. Well, just uh, maybe a couple more questions. So um, in, in your travels here and your communications with the Park Service. Um, is there anything that you took back from that of the bigger issues that are facing the Park Service now that, that folks might want to be aware of um, thing that, you, that you, you saw? So I think th this has been something that I saw, but also like it's been um, discussed, especially a lot more recently, the, the kind of it, the, the, the Park Service, like in terms of staffing, but also in terms of visitorship is not as diverse, um, you know, as, as, as the population. And there's, I mean, it's, there's academic studies, there's different barriers. So um, that's something that, that, that is an issue and it's something to kind of be, you know, co cognizant of. So encouraging, I mean, now you could almost be like, once you're kind of into the international parks, I mean, there's some people that are like, you know, they're like the collectors and they're going to like all 419 and you know they're really they're evangelists kind of for the park but I think even for those of us you know like that are not as keen and, and you know like not every vacation is going to be a national park vacation you know encourage everyone in your, your in your in your community you know at work at home you know school church whatever to to to, to visit the parks because I think that I had no access issues like I had, I, I, you know, there was, it was right in front of me, literally, and I didn't even realize it. So I just think that everyone can kind of do, um, to help promote, because, you know, they do belong to us, and it's important that, you know, we realize, like, what great treasures we have, but also to protect them for the future, we have to have um, as much of 
you know, a popular support as possible. And I think that when you visit, it's like an automatic win. Like you, you realize how important they are, but you, you, know, you need to get people there. And I think there's a misunderstanding also that, you know, sometimes people think it's expensive. And some of the parks do charge 30 or $40 in parking and things like that. You can buy a pass, $80 for the whole year. And it gets you into all, all the parks. If you're military, it's free. If, you, if you're a fourth grader, it's free. Um, if you're um, a senior citizen, it's very much reduced. So there, there are ways to, but the, the, the majority of the parks, like especially the, like the, the lesser known ones, they don't charge anything at all. So um, I think sometimes people think, oh, it's gonna be expensive or like they're thinking, okay, I live on the East Coast, I have to go to Utah. I mean, there's, you know, there's a lot of things in, in, in between. In addition to, you know, the city, state, you know, county, local, like, and um, the natural, national, natural landmarks, which there's a great, um, I can't call it up now, but there's actually a great map um, online that helps you see that. Because I was actually just driving sometimes and I would come across a sign. I'm like, what is that? You know, it's like, I'm like, and I didn't know it was one of these natural landmarks. So if you want to be kind of more calculating in how you um, plan it out. Well, I know uh, you know when Shalyan reached out to us and Wilderness Global to possibly uh, partner on this. Um, you know, you had mentioned a couple of things that, that we're actually taking advantage of here locally. One was uh, the National Park Trust and the Friends groups uh, that operate for parks. So we have one in Mammoth Cave, and they've given a grant to actually allow us to bring students out to Mammoth Cave from underserved areas of Louisville. So we're really excited about that. So you, right. you just hit on the nail that there's a lot of opportunities to work with local parks. Um, right. So we're, we're, we're coming up on time and I think uh, Xiao Yin's probably going to want to say some, a few things to wrap up, but it's been a great conversation. So appreciate the comments from the, from the audience. And I uh, just want to thank you again for. No, for thank you. Thank you. All right. Well, thank you both so much for that conversation and certainly for our audience for uh, all the great questions they were able to pose. Um, that's a very wide ranging conversation. We went from parks to the Foreign Service and all the opportunities in between. So thank you, Christine and Bennett for uh, taking us um, on that journey. Um, I know that this year more than other years, uh, probably there's been a lot more exploration about our natural environment, particularly our park systems, locally and state. Um, I know I've been on those because that seems to be much more accessible than anywhere else. Air travel is very hard. So I'm hoping that as a community and a state and that we see some fruits of, of our own, you know, residents getting to reap the benefits of what they, what's right behind and in their backyards, as Christine said. Um, so thank you so much. Uh, I think we will, you know, uh, look forward to more of what you have uh, in store, in particular with maybe your podcast, if you are going to continue with that. Uh, it sounds like a really interesting conversation that you have with kids and it's a really good to make sure that kids get that access early on to appreciate nature because the older they get, sometimes they just get lazy and they just don't want to. And it, it could be much later until they, they decide to pick it up. Uh, so we will uh, get that link from Christine about their expedition uh, podcast and share that with the follow-up. And other than that, um, we really appreciate everybody joining us for this today. And uh, we will be sending some follow-up Maybe there's some resources that Christine had shared in her slides, including the map and some other things. And perhaps Bennett might share some resources with us on the local uh, parks and systems that we have. And we'll include all of that in the follow-up to uh, people who who's, uh, register for this program today. So we thank you and I hope uh, you have a wonderful week. And Christine, stay in touch and uh, best of luck in Brussels and your new thank adventure. You Yes. And uh, please, if you do listen, I love any feedback. Thank you so much. Everyone. Absolutely. All right. Take Thanks. care, everyone, and stay well and healthy. Thank bye bye. You. Thank you.